one thing that like the rest like they that they're there. Okay, I'm gonna get started now. Um, so thank you for coming to our preliminary design review for Space Four. Um, so I'll start uh, with intro introductions. Um, I'm Anu, I'm the project manager. We have Avi. Um, he's our deputy project manager for Space Four. I'm gonna go down line and introduce all of our sub team leads. So first we have Ed, he's our aerodynamic sub team lead. Then we have Carly, structures. Uh, then also Avi again, he's actually right now in a special position serving as an interim payload lead until the actual payload lead comes back from his co-op, and his name is Joey. Then we have Gordon, who is our avionics lead, Ray for recovery, and then Casey for propulsion. So. so what is the purpose of our project? So the Spaceport project team, our main purpose every year that we strive to achieve is to compete in the Spaceport in America Cup competition. And for those unaware, this is the largest intercollegiate uh, rocketry competition in the world. And also international competition, where I know this year they accepted 150 teams out of around 200 applicants. So it's also decently competitive as well. Um, so at this competition, there are six categories that you can enter to compete in. And I'll explain that SRAD is a acronym if you're not familiar. It stands for Student Research and Develop, and COP stands for Commercial Off the Shelf. So there are all these different categories where you have different altitudes as well. So you can uh, make a rocket to go up to 10,000 feet or you can make a rocket go 30,000 feet, and et cetera. So our, at Ohio State, our project goal is, our main goal every year is to be successful in the 30K SRAD category. And also SRAD pertains mostly to the motor, which means it's student research and design. So in order, the way we view being successful at the competition is through confirming the SRAD's rules on design, and then Personally, our team always strives to have the majority of the rocket composed of SRAP parts. This is kind of special to our team as we feel that just the challenge of creating every part of the rocket, it's easy to go out and just buy commercial parts and then put it together. But this extra added challenge of creating every part of the rocket is something that makes activity much more interesting and challenging. Um, another one of our goals is to perform tasks while staying safe. We haven't had any major accidents yet and we want to keep it that way. And then finally, to continue to provide an outlet to practice hands-on engineering. This is a big thing, as a lot of students here know that classwork alone doesn't always strive, doesn't always achieve the true engineering spirit, I would like to say. Um, and this activity is one that I found that actually gets you thinking like a true engineer. So I want to start with the project design motivation. So the overall motivation for our designs here just stems from how we perform in past years. So as an example, last year, we did great in integration, as that was issued the year before, but we did not do so well with our actual performance during flight. So what happened is that we found that there was an issue with the motor formula, which caused it to go to only around 360 feet, instead of hopefully going closer to around 30,000 feet. So in order to mitigate this, and some design changes we're looking to do, or program changes as well, is that the first thing is to prioritize a full-scale motor test as we didn't get time or enough money allocated to do this last year, so this year it's going to be it's a huge priority so we can catch any issues. Um, the second thing is even though we succeeded in the faster integration process last year, it's very easy to lose sight of these goals in the long term. So that's something this year we also want to make sure we still, we still are focusing on with additional design changes and just making sure that integration isn't a lengthy process that puts us behind. And then finally, we want to advance the abilities of our current sub-teams. Because even if we figure out how to do something perfectly, it's not fun to do that year like over and over again every year. So as an example this year that Gordon will talk about more later, is that for our avionics team, we're trying to venture into the new realm of creating our own custom flight computers. And that'll be an interesting project that will be challenging to us, but also very rewarding. So finally, I'm going to go over how this whole, the whole PDR is going to go out. So every sub-team lead is going to come up, and what they're going to uh, talk about is their sub-team purpose and their objectives, um, the process that they take for design, including any like additional tools they use, um, the risk, uh, risk and mitigation methods as well, and then finally schedule for the year. And I also want to mention, so Avi's going to go around and pass out this form. It's called a Review Item Disposition Form, or RID. So we would just like to ask all of you to fill it out if you can, and essentially it's just getting your opinions on our design so far, or preliminary ideas at least and getting what you guys think about it or if there are some special um, considerations you've overlooked. 
But, and also on the back, I would like to point out there's a new box for additional comments. And just for any additional comments that don't fit in the templates given at the time. With that being said, I'm going to introduce our first sub team lead to talk, which is Edge. Hey, you're new. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ed. I'm the Aerodynamics sub team lead. Um, so our purpose is to enable the success of the rocket by characterizing it uh, aerodynamically, as well as enhancing our current members' understandings of uh, fluid mechanics and CFD tools and techniques. Um, so our main objectives are compute the aerodynamic loadings on the rocket during, uh, during flight, as well as uh, ensure that it's stable and that any instabilities during flight won't be uh, detrimental to the expected apogee and to the total flight of the rocket. Um, we also recommend optimization of our rocket components, components, such as the nose cone and the fins, depending on the CFD results and our analysis of them. Um, and we also are looking to hopefully improve our team's ability to predict the flight of the rocket, because we've, in the past we've always used uh, methods that come from software, such as Open Rocket, um, and there's always room for improvement there. And then finally, we're always looking to improve our methods of uh, computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. And uh, that, in terms of that, that means uh, better methods of obtaining results and better methods of analysis. So as far as our design process goes, we begin the year with three uh, tutorials to sort of introduce members to CFD and to the so uh, software that we'll be using, which is ANSYS Fluent. Um, it's a very comprehensive and large software, so it's not an easy software to learn. So that process kind of continues throughout the fall and even throughout the year. There's always uh, new things to learn. Um, the initial rocket design is given to us at the beginning of the project timeline, as soon as that's finalized. And then from there, we begin our initial simulations, which have always been in the past and are this year, a uh, 2D axisymmetric simulation, which means that we take half the rocket body, which is an example can be seen up here, and then we rotate it around that bottom axis to simulate a 3D shape. And it's a simpler way of obtaining or mimicking uh, 3D results while still using 2D computational power. Um, so we simulate that max Q, which is obtained from the open rocket simulation. And max Q means maximum dynamic pressure, because that's where the forces are going to be maximized on the rocket during its flight. So if we can uh, determine the forces there, then anything under that will be OK for our flight. Um, we also run the initial simulation without fins or without fin cam. As an axisymmetric simulation, we'll rotate that fin all the way around the rocket, creating a sort of block at the end of it. And so that won't give us accurate results at all. So anytime we want to uh, simulate the fins or the fin cam, they'll have to move in the 3D simulations. Um, and then once we get those simulation results, we analyze them, we look at the results, and then recommendations can be made where drag can be reduced, such as the nose cone or at the tip or at the uh, transition piece. Um, and I want to note too that the current rocket design has not changed from last year's. So that's been a good tool for us, I think, is that we can compare our results from this year so far to last year's results and sort of uh, get a good comparison of if our methods are correct so far this year. So this is our preliminary results for uh, laminar flow, which means the flow is very straight and there's no eddies or swirls in it. Uh, it's sort of ideal flow in a low speed flow. Um, and as you can see, there's high uh, shockwave nose cone at the transition piece, but these are expected, these match up with our results from previous years. Um, and again, there's always room for improvement there. And then we can compare that, those are also the turbulence model, which means that there's going to be eddies and, uh, and swirls in the flow and the flow is gonna mix together so that it's much more complex flow. So it's harder to simulate, but also more accurate to real life. Um, this is using a model called SST K Omega, which is a uh, well-accepted model for low Reynolds numbers flow. Um, that is another area we can improve further. Uh, but again, these results are similar to the laminar flow, um, the shock of the nose cone transition piece. And there's always room for improvement here, but they're about what we expect so far. So the risk to project success, um, as far as estimating drag, which we won't do until we have a 3D simulation, as uh, the 2D simulation numbers will, will not be accurate enough. But if we overestimate that drag, that can lead to over, uh, over building the rocket, which means uh, essentially adding, adding more weight when it's not necessary. It means that we may have to 
increase the motor thrust or either the overshoot our expected apogee or if we don't increase the motor thrust, we'll undershoot our expected apogee due to the added weight. Um, and then as far as underestimating the drag, that can lead to structural failures if the drag and pressure in the rocket, the drag in the rocket is too great. Uh, and then as far as mitigating that, uh, 3D simulations will provide a much more accurate drag parameter as I said. So that'll be important to get into as the year progresses in trying to obtain an accurate drag number. Um, and then we can also verify the methods that we the methods that we use currently, which just means more research, more analysis, more comparison. Um, and then the other big issue of the other big risk to project success would be static and dynamic instability. Um, so static instability would be the rocket comes off kilter during launch and that's going to prog uh, progressively get worse during launch and that can lead to catastrophic uh, failure, structural failure and a uh, complete loss of the rocket. And then dynamic instability which would be small dis uh, disturbances during the flight and that can uh, affect internal components as well as um, lead to a lower expected apogee. Um, and to mitigate that, it's important to look at different pressure distributions, whether it's um, in open rocket or in uh, ANSYS Fluent, our CFD software. And then we can also look at other test conditions, or other flight conditions uh, other than max, to max Q, which would give us comparison points. So our current plan for the year is that, as far as our transition piece goes on the rocket, there wasn't much documentation on why it's the shape it is. It's currently a conical shape. Um, so we're going to look into maybe a different uh, design, different shape there, and see if there's a way to reduce the drag at the transition. Um, we're also planning to refine our current 2D uh, transit or uh, turbulence model, um, and hopefully get transit real smooth, which means it's extended over time. Um, the turbulence model is currently that we're using is just the default values. It's the default model in Fluent, so there's a lot to be learned there for sure. Um, and then hopefully we'll move into 3D simulations, which requires uh, supercomputer access in order to run the full simulations. And we're potentially be getting a, hopefully a team project account on uh, our supercomputer center, but sort of a longer term goal. And then our long, long term goal is uh, developing a flight predictor tool, which would involve taking previous year's launch data and compare it with simulation data there, and hopefully being able to build a tool that predicts accurately where our rocket's gonna fly to. So, any questions? I would also like to add a quick note. So, at the end of every sub-team lead, they're going to have uh, a slide for questions. So, this will only be five minutes long, just to pertain so we can keep the presentation moving. But if you have more questions that, like, once the five minutes elapse, we we'll also have a section at the very end where you can ask these questions. Quick question. Yes. Has the team looked at polishing the motor case and polishing the fins and the fin cam? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we have. Here, sorry. I have, especially. Um, it's something I was debating doing this year if we had enough time. It's really time dependent. Um, but yes, we have. Yes, sir. Um, so, a couple slides back, you were talking about dynamic instability versus static stability. Um, how important are you, or how much are you going to pursue this dynamic instability versus the other goals? Uh, I think it's something that if we have time after the rocket design is. Uh, fully finished after the TDR potentially, if it's something to pursue. Um, I mean, that involves looking at the pressure calipers and the pressure distribution along the rocket. Um, so I think it's, ideally, we'd like to do it before the, the end of the year. All right, um, quick follow-up question to that, uh, Yeah. Um, so you're talking about checking out the conditions besides an XQ, uh, what kind of conditions are you um, Probably the transition between uh, subsonic and supersonic flow. Um, or subsonic and supersonic flight, and then uh, probably the apogee, expected apogee, I would imagine. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Along that same line, how are you actually going to collect that kind of information in a dynamic situation? Um, so, as far as the information goes, I think Open Rocket provides um, pressure data for the whole expected. Uh, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is in real time. Oh, well. Because you're taking yeah. dynamic okay, done yeah. in the computer versus dynamic in reality. Because yeah. that's what you're looking to. Yeah, I think, sorry, okay. So it, it's, with anything on aerodynamics, it's kind of, there are assumptions that have to be made, and sort of concessions that have to be made, where you have to understand that what you're looking at isn't always 100% realistic. It may not, probably not going to be what happens in real life. So you kind of 
kind of have to accept that to uh, see with the field, with the analysis that you do? Yes, sir. Back. Uh, looking towards moving to uh, analyze a 3D rocket body using supercomputers, do you believe that the uh, additional accuracy of the 3D analysis would be worth like the time and maybe extra resources of having to secure supercomputer access compared to just going about it the way that it's been going about in the past? Uh, yeah, I think 3D simulations are 100% uh, important. They're definitely very important. Um, as far as like the 2D accuracy of the drag value goes, it's probably not very accurate. Consider we don't add in the fin or the fin can, and it's very much an approximation of a 3D flow field. A 3D flow field interacts differently than a 2D flow field would. Um, so it's definitely very important to try to get the 3D simulation complete and get results there. And then, what would the timeline be like that if you were to go about? Uh, ideally, we'd be able to get 3D simulation results by the CDR, which would be early January, I believe. Um, if not, then by competition time, so for some of the judges there. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a couple. Yeah. Um, modeling the radial bolts in the thin can, is that something that's got to wait to the th until you do the 3D model? Or yeah. Or is it something? I was just curious that even in the 2D model, if you put something in the airflow, yeah, it realistically, it will bump and just see what it does. Yeah, and that was actually a project I was working on at the end of last year before the competition was um, including the all the like the shear fins and the uh, bolts and fin cam. But okay. I think including the fin cam without the fins is kind of almost pointless because you're not going to have fin cam without fins. So it's sort of giving empty results, or it's hard to analyze the results when there's no fin also in the flow. Okay. Yeah, it was more just because that fin can is yeah, it is external. Yeah, um, it's definitely something we could look at too moving forward. Um, the only other one was, I know that two years ago, there was talk of actually getting some time in the wind tunnels. Yeah. Even to the point where I think we made a model and a static tube and everything else. And anything else ever there's been a little bit of that. There's been a little talks of it. Um, I think one of the wind tunnels is currently down, not working. So there's always difficulties getting actual access to the wind tunnels, especially as capstones progress in the uh, in the spring. It's very difficult to get them. Is um, there like six or seven up, up at the York? So it, we have. Um, I think we just or we're going to be walking Dr. Gregory, who runs the York, through uh, our workspace at the CDME next week. Um, um, yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, um, but hopefully we'll be able to sort of work with him. That'd be nice to be able to get uh, wind tunnel time there. That's definitely something we could look at though, especially as like, the transition pieces go, to try to confirm our uh, simulation results. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'll hand it over to Carl, our structure team. according to the flight requirements of the competition. Um, the great thing about being an SR team is that the structure team gets to build all of our components from scratch. Um, it means we get these hands-on opportunities to um, use industry standard procedures of composite manufacturing. Um, and we're also trying to justify the flight readiness of each of our pieces through simulations and testing. The objectives for this year, um, similar to years prior, have been to minimize weight and drag. Um, that's basically so that we can get to that 30,000 foot mark um, without comp compensating with a higher power motor. Um, do all that while maximizing the strength of the rocket uh, using high strength to weight ratio materials, um, like carbon fiber. Um, and also I've said this, but doesn't simulate to make informed design decisions. Um, save time um, and be a little bit more careful and prove that it'll work. Um, so I've included a picture of the full layout and assembly. Um, basically the same parts are going to be the nose cone didn't change so much from years prior 
some are the body tube and the motor tube and the bin can, but most of our um, changes are going to be seen here in the transitional section. So I'll kind of go over that in the next slide too. Um, so nose can body tube, motor tube, bin can are mostly the same, but this coupler here is kind of going back to a previous design. Um, the coupler slides into the body tube, um, so it's completely concealed. It's got a flat plate here on the back that's continuous with the coupler itself, so we laid up as one whole piece. Um, then what's gonna happen is this motor tube mount is going to bolt up through the coupler and through the transition piece to fix them all together. Um, like usual, the motor tube mount slides onto the motor tube and the forces from the fins and the nose cone will be distributed throughout the motor tube mount. Um, so something different from last year's design is going to be seen at the transition piece. Um, the transition piece first is smaller um, and secondly it's not load bearing. Um, last year it was load bearing and because that we had to make it very thick. It was also fiberglass because the um, telemetry waves were over there. Um, to transmit radio frequency signals through it. Um, so it had to be fiberglass and it also had to be very thick because it was load bearing. This year it's not going to be load bearing, so we can make it um, much thinner and therefore much lighter. Okay. Um, so to get there, uh, right now we're focusing on composite testing. Um, we're working on a lab here at Scott um, to test the strength properties of all of our materials. Um, different characteristics and make design decisions based on the data that we get. Um, so data from previous years suggests using a bidirectional carbon fiber weave. Um, we could use different weaves or different composite materials, um, but we're kind of diving into more specific details about the bidirectional weave because um, it was suggested to be the best one for previous data. Um, so we're kind of looking into the specific epoxy um, the number of layers and combinations uh, added into the layout process that kind of make our layout much easier and result in a higher quality piece. Um, then of course, at the end of all that, we'll take the data and present it in a manner that is easy to read and find so that future iterations of the team can use it. So after we get the composite data and the results from the aerodynamic simulations, um, we'll plug it into a finite element analysis software um, maybe ANSYS stack, structural, or abacus. Um, basically to simulate the loads at max Q or maximum dynamic pressure, um, loads during parachute deployment, and loads at landing um, to kind of predict how our rocket's going to perform and see how everything's going to work together and if, if it'll work the way we're expecting. Um, the emphasis on this, I'd like to emphasize gaining experience with the software and continu continuing to pass on the information so that it doesn't kind of like die out. So I know we kind of used this two years ago, um, but haven't so much recently. Um, and then of course, use the simulation results to edit our design and make changes where it needs to be. Okay, so risk to success. Um, I think the structures team is famous for being behind. Um, it's usually because of delays that we encounter that we just can't predict. Um, so I'm not gonna say that there's not gonna be delays because there will be. Um, but we can plan to have most of our um, busy, busy stuff in the coming months so that we can try to get it all done and then have months later on where we make up for the delays. Um, so we'll do that. And another one is time consuming integration. Um, that and kind of getting everything together and realizing something's not gonna work. So again, um, mitigate by integrating early and having time and also continuously, continuously evaluating um, our SOLIDWORKS files and our design, um, checking for errors before we start building. So also two years ago, um, I heard about the rocket shrinking when it got out to New Mexico in the heat. Um, this was likely because the epoxy wasn't cured all the way. Um, this year it didn't happen because our pieces were fully cured. They sat for about two weeks and we ran through a hotter baking cycle. So we'll do that again this year. Um, and then lastly, of course, catastrophic structural failure would come if our tests weren't reliable enough or if we didn't test enough. So we would just have to make sure we try to think of every scenario where it would fail and uh, run generalizable tests so that we can predict where it might fail. So kind of what I was talking about before, um, 
putting all of our work towards like these next four months. Um, so November, December, we'll be trying to finish our designs and uh, finalize using simulation FDA stuff. Um, and then January, February, we'll start building, hopefully wrapping up our build by March and getting ready for our test launch in April. Um, then after our test launch, around May-ish, um, we'll make adjustments and wrap up and complete our competition. I'm going to leave this first slide up because I think it's more useful. Um, but are there any questions? Carly, two questions for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Regarding the fin can on design and fabrication, is the team going to continue to buy fin cans from Mike Fisher or are they looking at designing and fabricating their own? We have thought about and looked into designing and fabricating our own um, composite fin can. Um, it'd be really beneficial for us to move forward with that. Um, I think if we did go on to do a carbon fiber fin can, um, it would fly on a test rocket, but it would have to have really, really good results in the test rocket for us to trust it on the competition rocket. Um, yes, yes, it does. <coughs> the second part of that is, is for your test rocket, excuse me, uh, is this a full scale test or a subscale test? This is a subscale test. Um, you want to elaborate on this? I don't think we're allowed to fly to 30,000 feet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to find 3,000 feet, so it's going to be around 10,000 ish. Yeah, like 8,000. At least it's been in the past, at least. I like the ish. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So this might be more of a project management kind of question, but um, how often do you meet with avionics, payload, and recovery, subsystems, not integration? Not often enough. <laughs> like that? <So>, yeah. <laughs> Um, we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the unique thing about the design this year that I've tried to focus on is kind of reducing the need for like constant, like if there's any design changes in avionics this year, you'll see later when Gordon elaborates more, but the avionics subsystem is a lot more contained and not as um, interlocked with structures as it was in the past. So if they were to change like a connector size or a wire size, it wouldn't affect structures. Also, um, we all work in the CDME, and I see these people like floating around there all the time. Um, so if I have a question for them, I'll just like get in their space and ask them. And so, yeah. So it looks like all your testing right up at the beginning. There's no testing of the structure after that. So it's kind of going to be a running thing. I know I put it like in black and white right there, um, but obviously we'll continue checking our design as we keep going. Um, before we start building any of these specific pieces um, would be when we check to make sure it's okay before we go for build. Um, what do you think the critical uh, condition is that you've tested? For which piece? For the, the structural integrity of the, um, the missile. So compressive testing or tensile testing? Yeah, and also our uh, test launch that we do every year usually is a uh, it helps us confirm to like at least a small amount uh, that we know it's structurally sound at least traveling to like 10,000 feet. And at least we get a full test for a recovery system going to 10,000 feet. Because it deploys at, uh, the main parachute deploys at I think 1,500 feet, either way. But um, structurally, we kind of rely more on simulation this year because it's kind of difficult to simulate the actual compressive forces that the rocket endures when it's actually going to 30,000 feet. How are you analyzing the uh, coupling, structurally analyzing the coupling? We have been um, trying to make really specific tests to, um, can I go back? Are you talking mostly about like right here? Yeah, because you're taking a flat plate. Absolutely. You're bolting it mm -hmm. to a composite. So how are you going to make that work? We've done a few tests um, trying to model this joint right here, um, just trying to bend it and break it and seeing at what force it'll break at. Um, I think the way we're going to move forward is doing more of those tests and trying to find tests that um, will be like better to I don't know, model that scenario. Um, Do you even know how much to torque the bolts to? No, not yet, um, not entirely yet. Um, but we're relying more on uh, the aerodynamics um, data to help us with that. 
Well, I just look at it as you're going to get somebody in there who's going to torque it down and fracture your carbon fiber. That's definitely a concern I've, I've thought about. Um, and are you making the holes ahead of time as you're making it, or are you drilling it later? Or? It'll be drilled later, but I've been looking into more uh, fabrication techniques with composites, and I've found a few uh, tools that we can buy that can help, uh, like help with the heating that's generated if you were to drill through the composite and weaken it. Um, so a lot of that's just kind of looking at better manufacturing practices than we have now. Yeah, because that's where you typically get your failures is in the manufacturing. Work with a lot of machinery where there's always somebody who wants to torque it just a little too much, mm -hmm. and, and then that will become your failure point. I've actually looked a lot into fasteners recently just because of that reason. Um, no, that's definitely something that we are keeping in the back of our minds going forward. What other comment regarding the transition? Remember, there's going to be a giant temperature difference between central Ohio versus the Mexican desert, plus of that rocket sitting on the pet for any length of time. Those who have been out there know that there's a long lag between the time you put the rocket on the pad and the time that you go back to actually push your button. So you're going to get some some very, very weird temperature influences on that joint. So. We'll take one more question and then we'll have to move on. Um, just really quick, you had mentioned that there's uh, that there have been reasons for delays in the past. Could you be a little bit more specific about what those pain points were and what we're doing to change that? So a lot of the time it's ordering and um, realizing where you don't have something um, and placing the order, but then it takes a few weeks to get there. Um, other reasons have been um, parts have came out and they didn't come out the way we wanted them to, um, so we had to remake them um, maybe once or twice in some cases, um, things like that. There are probably a lot more scenarios, but those are just two examples. Have you built time for that in your schedule? <laughs> yeah. So, Deputy Project Manager, also the interim payload lead stepping in for Joe while he's on his co-op right now. Um, so the project purpose for payload is to design and develop the payload bay that contains the payloads and then also to design and develop the payloads themselves or solicit payloads from other outside organizations. Uh, so involved in that is developing efficient integration, educating new members on payload systems, problem solving, that sort of thing, um, and obviously producing an effective structure for the CubeSats in the payload bay. So the objectives for this year are to collaborate with external organizations, which is something we haven't done as much in the past, uh, to get payloads from them to send up to 30,000 feet. Um, and then obviously, if we need to, we will design some experiments ourselves as well to include in the rocket. Um, integration is always a really big thing to improve, so we're continuously improving that all the time. Um, and then also advancing the overall payload and payload system design capabilities of BSLI. So the design process is pretty simple this year. We're going to be keeping the over, overall design from previous years because it's been proven to work in past launches. Um, here is a preliminary design of the payload bay. So we can see it's got the four rails that, um, and the four B pieces to slide all the payloads in, which are all going to be CubeSats. Uh, if anyone's not familiar with that, it's just a standardized 10 centimeter cube box uh, for payloads. So a couple risks, obviously relying on outside sources for our payloads means that if they don't <coughs> make them in time or something is not working on the outside payloads, that's going to be a problem. Um, the payload bay can structurally fail, so if there's some excessive launch forces that cause um, the, the, the structure to collapse or uh, any kind of heat deformation or heating from the being in the desert that causes it to fail, 
And then the payloads that we develop ourselves obviously can fail in a couple ways. Uh, big ones are loss of power and experiment detachment, which is just the experiment itself coming loose from the payload structure. So ways we'll mitigate that is um, for reliance on outside sources, we'll be making uh, backup dummy payloads since we have to get the payload weight up to a certain amount anyways for the competition. Um, for structural failure, we know that the CubeSat design that we are using has been successful in previous launches, so we're already pretty confident that that won't be an issue. Um, we'll, the, the payload bay itself will be designed so that the launch forces are distributed through the rails of the CubeSats themselves, which are strong based on, the, the again, the previous launch data that we have. And then for heating issues, um, we're going to avoid using any kind of heat-sensitive material like 3D printed PLA in any structural areas of the rocket. Uh, for experiment failure, all our power sources uh, for battery loss will be connected with uh, an active locking connector, something that we've used on avionics systems in the past. Um, and then any extra required weight that we need to add to meet the competition requirements will be added to those in the form of structural support, so we'll have added um, strength there. So the plan for the year, the next two months, are going to be finalizing the design of the payload bay and uh, establishing timelines and procedures and stuff with any outside organizations that we're working with. Then in January and February, we'll be manufacturing the payload bay and continuing to work with the outside organizations and designing our own payloads and dummy weights. And then March through May, we'll be manufacturing and assembling the BSLI payloads, um, continuing, just continuously throughout this whole thing, we'll be following up with the external organizations that we're working with to make sure that they're on schedule and things are going well. And we will also be making sure in March through May that the integration of the payload bay into the rocket goes smoothly and that the integration of the payloads into the payload bay goes smoothly. Does anyone have any questions? I got a couple. Uh, structural requirements for third party CubeSat owners. Yes. Do we have something written down that you can hand these people and say, hey, it has to survive this? We have uh, an initial requirement written down. Uh, I'm going to go through and continue working on that. You're getting to the point to get anybody to build anything. They're going to start asking. That's something they yeah. need to know. Oh, yeah. We have a document that's, uh, I think they tried to use last year when they were getting the high school payloads. Uh, we have a document that was written up that has all the requirements for it. So I am currently working on going through that and making sure all of those requirements are uh, valid. Got somebody to help you build this thing this year? I know it's been just you basically the last two years. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so far, uh, we don't have any new members on the payload, but when Joe comes back next semester, we'll have him as well as me. And then <laughs> uh, we'll also be continuing to do um, recruitment and stuff. Uh, with a big, I think we'll have a big recruitment event next semester, right? Yeah, so we're going to do the FCC launch in the spring, so yeah, we could yeah. keep doing we're gonna have a, a big focus on that. Well, a big reason, too, we don't have like members officially on payload yet is that we've kind of combined payload and avionics training this year, which again, Gordon will mention, um, to like a weather balloon training event. So essentially, only after the semester will kind of segment people into the respective subgroups. I know we get Bobby back next year, but the issue is it's an area that I can see the information is not getting passed on to the next generation back here. Payload sections look fantastic. If there's nobody else that can do it, when you go, that whole thing goes away and we start from scratch again. So I'd really like to see you get somebody helping you help. Uh, the other one was you and I talked a little bit about, I know it's probably the wrong question because it's only you right now, uh, talking about next year ramping up the internal structure. Where the structure, the loads are being carried by the internal structure with just the skin on it. Uh, have you gotten anywhere 
I didn't see anything mentioned in there. It's yeah. something that you were thinking about working on. Um, as of right now, the structure has been focused primarily on the design for this year. But I have, in the back of my mind at least, I've got um, some running ideas that I'm going to try and incorporate later on as we develop the design more um, for testing out that structural. Yeah, I just, anything to get people excited about it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of your thing, and that's been great, but to get somebody excited about carrying the work forward. So. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any sort of target organizations you'd like to reach out to specifically, such as a school or maybe a company? Um, yeah, so initially we wanted to reach out to other clubs at OSU, and we did contact a couple, but it doesn't seem like any of them really have the time or capability to um, develop a, a useful payload for us. So right now we have been reaching out to other Spaceport America Cup teams. Uh, with the idea of maybe doing a payload swap where we build something for them and they build something for us to kind of keep things interesting. Um, we haven't heard back uh, too much on that yet, but that's currently where, where we're headed. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. I'll hand it off to Gordon. Cool. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Gordon. I'm the avionics uh, team for the Spaceport America Cup okay. team. <laughs> uh, avionics team lead. Sorry, I'm not the whole team. <laughs> um, cool. So, uh, just start with the project purpose. So, one of our main goals is to teach uh, our new members and the members general high reliability performance electronics uh, through the design of electrical systems critical to the flight control, tracking, day logging of the rocket. So some of the objectives uh, for this year is uh, designing and building a custom flight computer. Uh, I'll, talk more about, I'll talk more about all this stuff later. Um, but then designing a payload camera computer on uh, telemetry arming system. So we're trying to work on uh, making more of that um, more, you can arm it like one of the rockets on the pad instead of having to uh, turn them on at integration. Because that will save a lot of, can save weight on battery and also should just be more reliable in general because we're not relying as much on, the, on waiting to go out to the pad and everything. Um, collecting flight video as usual. Uh, deploying the drogue parachutes at Apogee and the main parachutes at altitude, obviously that's kind of the main point of what we do. And then uh, being able to successfully and track and recover the rocket to the telemetry system, and then also to continue to develop the knowledge, the base knowledge of the avionics team um, to go for the future. So some of the main design reasoning, so one of our big things is building our advancements from last year. So last year, uh, avionics was uh, pretty good at what we did. So we had successful parachute deployment all the way around, and the arming system also was um, successful all the way around. Um, so and so in lieu of that, we're working on expanding the Bluetooth arming to control more aspects of the rocket, so not just the flight computers, um, but we'll talk about it more later. Um, so one of the big parts of that is having one communication bus that will connect all the electronics to the rocket. Um, so this will allow for a standardized arming system. Um, it reduces the amount of batteries necessary, because again, we can arm multiple things um, without having to arm them with integration. Um, it also increases system reliability, um, just because we'll have you know, you won't have to worry about your batteries running out or whatever, um, just because you're waiting to get to the pad. Um, and then also, uh, we'll make future, like just what we're looking at, we'll make future module additions easy to add or remove, um, very easy to implement and improve in the future, which is a really big thing. Um, so in the bay, we'll talk about it more later too, but it's gonna be designed with the black plane um, and have a removable card. So it's, if you remember what the uh, bay for the NASA team last year looked like, it will look similar to that, um, they're really big, the cool part with that is that um, it'll be more structurally secure with more PCBs rather than wires running all over the place. Um, and also that will be a uh, big thing too, is we had some integration issues last year, but this year we'll be kind of integrating with payload and then sliding, sliding in and putting the rest of the body tube and everything together. So that should really help some of those issues that we've had in the past. Um, the custom flight computer is kind of a little more of a research project for us uh, to advance our, kind of our technical expertise and just the uh, level of custom stuff that we're making. And then uh, we're just planning to a commercial telemetry chase system this year, uh, just for reliability and also focusing on some of the other design ideas we have. Um, in the past, we've worked hard to try to get a uh, custom telemetry system that has ultimately never really been successful. Um, and so just with everything else going on this year, uh, we just felt it was best just to stick with the commercial system for this year, um, just for reliability. Um, so here's a basic system flowchart. 
Um, so this kind of outlines like the main thing about the main central communication bus is the arming system. So on the outside, we'll have a control box, um, and basically we'll be able to power that on, and then we'll have uh, some kind of menu interface uh, to be able to individually turn on different parts that are in the rocket. So and then on the inside, um, that'll communicate with a Bluetooth module, which will be paired with the Bluetooth module on the internal of the rocket side. Um, it will set all those codes in. Uh, we'll go to a central command controller, um, which basically will be able to distribute um, all those commands to the CAN bus, which is stands for controlled area network bus. It's a really common thing used in automotive because it can go really long distances um, compared to most communication protocols. And it's also very robust because the differential uh, programming scheme or communication scheme, which makes it very robust to noise and stuff, which is kind of the environment we're working in. Um, so that's a really big deal for us, and it'll be really cool. Um, so then just some examples of things, so the computer arming circuits um, will be similar to what we've had before, uh, but we'll be able to power on the telemetry and the Stratwater, which is a two-flight computer we're planning on using at this point. Um, have a camera arming circuit, so people arm the camera remotely, and then also um, have, we all have the capability to arm payloads uh, that wants to be done. Um, we'll see how that goes depending on what payloads we get, where we're putting them, or uh, not where we're putting them, but just like how the groups want to do that. Uh, but then we'll have the potential for that too. So this is an example of the bay design. Um, so we're working on designing a 2U cube set size. This one is a 3U cube set size. This is the 10K one from last year, but we're going to be doing a very similar design. Um, so it, one of the big features is that it's got the back plane um, that connects all the modules and handles all the communication between the different cards. Um, it also will be integrated, as I mentioned earlier, with the payload bay. Um, and that'll allow for simplicity during integration. Um, and then also we'll have, um, we'll be able to slide the body to over. And then also, you know, that'll make it easy to be able to communicate to the payload bays, to the payload bay if we decide to remotely arm the payloads. Um, and then um, it'll have removable card PCBs, as you kind of see the, whole, the horizontal ones and the one vertical one there in the middle. And that will allow for um, modularities to be able to move around with different things, which will be kind of neat. Um, so just, it should be more robust than some of the past connections that we've had. So commercial flight computers, so um, just if you, haven't, if you haven't been around for very long, um, so they're microcontrollers and they detect the apogee, which is the maximum path of the rocket, to deploy the drogue chute, which is a small parachute, and then usually around 1,500 feet above the ground, it'll deploy the main parachute. Um, so basically, they're just microcontrollers that are sensing the altitude and have the capability to ignite the charges to remove the nose cone and then also release the parachutes. Um, so this year we're planning on flying two commercials, the two commercial flight computers as uh, redundant systems that we have done in the past, completely electrically isolated, uh, completely set up so that um, if one were to completely fail, the other one should be able to continue the mission without any issues. Um, and it's similar to, past, similar to the past year's system design, so they're reliable. Um, and we we'll also get to reuse some of the parts, which will definitely save on some of the costs for this year, um, which is a really nice to be used out for other things then. Um, so a custom flight computer is something we're working on. Um, so we will be designing a custom flight computer. So basically it will be similar to the commercial ones, uh, but everything will be made in-house, kind of designed by us, which will be a nice challenge and something to advance our technical knowledge. Um, so we're working on doing a pressure alpha acceleration-based sensing, which is pretty common. Um, it won't work for like really high altitudes, but all the altitudes we're talking about at this point uh, would be fine for it. And also give us a starting point if we were to decide to move forward with that. Um, obviously, it needs to have the ability to deploy the parachutes. Um, and also, it needs to be robust and reliable. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, should enable a higher level of customization technical experience um, on our team. Um, and in this year, we'll probably likely fly in a non-critical role in the competition rocket, um, just because I don't want to, we don't want to fail a flight because of something like that. Um, but it would definitely be a really good test ground for that and maybe for use in the future. So the cameras, um, so in the past we used a uh, Raspberry Pi camera last year. Um, there are some issues with just the robustness of those parts and not really designed for um, the environment we were looking at, just struggles to get that to work. So this year, probably go back to what we used before, which is a modified action camera. Um, basically we can set to record on magnet and start up and just control the power. So we'll just give it power when we want to start recording, it'll just start recording. So, so that was the easiest method for this one. And again, that's something we can turn on through the camera, so which is um, telemetry, um, so obviously we need electronics to track the rocket throughout the flight and then also uh, for recovery. So we're, right now we're planning on using a commercial tele GPS system. Uh, it's a pretty reliable system, uh, relatively easy to integrate. Um, and this year there will be some nice parts because we're planning on having the entire telemetry part in the transition so we won't have to have wires running through between the bay and the transition piece which has been a really uh, big structural issue in the past for just getting it to integrate together. Pretty much for the last two years we've had issues with that. Um, so we're trying to avoid that this year, um, and this will just make, make that a lot easier uh, for now. 
Um, So some of the risks are our project success. Obviously, Bluetooth and communication failure. That would be really bad, because it, again, this, the risk with putting everything on one communication bus is if that bus fails and nothing works. Um, but most of the systems that we'd be arming anyways, we would launch without them working anyways. So um, that's, yeah, so that's some, something that we would have to address anyways. But mitigation is just doing extensive systems testing uh, to ensure the proper operation. Um, and again, like trying to use more robust connections like using the PCBs and stuff, things like that, rather than using just direct wires um, to improve that, those kinds of issues. Uh, base structural area or failure. Uh, we had, two years ago, we had a really big issue with this because um, we 3D printed the bay of the LA with the heat. Uh, we think that might have been one of the reasons why it crashed. Um, some big issues, we're trying to use an aluminum bay this year, uh, similar to what payload has, um, and that should really help standardize our bay design and also um, yeah, just be structurally strong. And then also smart placement of our header items like the batteries and stuff. Try to place them in locations where we'll have more structural support instead of just being held on by zip ties or something like that. Um, so maybe I see involvement. So just really try to keep the team involved because obviously there's a lot of things we need to do this year uh, to develop if we want to get all this stuff done. Um, so that's going to be a really big thing is just trying to uh, keep that going and then also um, just advance the technical knowledge as we're going along so people can contribute. Um, and then launch delays and power loss. So um, again, you know, sometimes you go out to the pad and then you turn everything on, you go back, and then a rocket blows up right next to yours and you have to wait an hour while they make sure there's not a fire or anything. Um, so again, trying to wait to the last possible to arm components and then obviously just planning for extra time, like maybe double or triple the amount of time we think we'll need out there um, just so that we don't run into that issue. So, so the plan for this year, um, so I haven't really talked about yet because it's kind of already in motion, but uh, we're planning to do a high altitude balloon launch in uh, a couple weeks here. Um, so that's kind of what we've been using this year to conclude our new member workshops and it's, it's kind of a design challenge too. So that's been a new thing for us. Uh, it's been really successful so far. So we're really looking forward to all of that. So hopefully everyone can come out um, and be with us when we do that. Obviously everyone's invited. So um, that'll be a lot of fun. And it's been a really good way to get our uh, Get, get kind of some of our newer members, less experienced members, up to speed on some of the electronic stuff. Um, well, not more. Yeah. So, um, and then in November, December, December, we'll be splitting in interest groups. Um, kind of, I have several lists out there, just different things that people will be working on as they go along. Um, January, I have the CDR right at the beginning, um, so we'll finalize our systems design uh, and figure out how all the parts are going to fit together. And then January through March will be acquiring the components, assembling the boards, and testing the individual boards. To go along and then April will be in our systems testing and pre preparation for our test flight. So that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you were going to do your own flight review about uh, software. Are you going to develop the software for that or are there software packages you can just well, when I, when I say flight computer, it's a microcontroller, so it's embedded programming, so it doesn't really have a full operating system and everything. Um, but yeah, we would develop the, the embedded software for that, yes. And then you can test that? Yeah, well, we could, there's, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah. There are other ways you can test that. We have several smaller rockets, like different CERT rockets, stuff like that, CERT rockets. Um, I mean, you know, with pressure and stuff, too, they're able to use like a pressure chamber also to see, just see how that goes. And there'll be a way built in the software to test like the, ex the ejection chargers and stuff without having to actually have it in an environment. There'll be a way you can send it a command to like test them and things. But yeah, that's, that's part of the reason, too, why we don't want to, we probably won't end up flying in a critical role this year. Because obviously, like it's going to be really hard to get a a comfortable amount of test data to where I feel comfortable putting the controller rocket into something that we've made. So, Jack, I think you might have just answered my question, but when you said not in a critical role, does that mean not connected to recovery at all? Yeah, so it wouldn't be connected to recovery at all. We would use it more of a, as a test bed, so it would just be in the bay, um, and I don't know we have to come maybe. Maybe put a little match on there or something just to make sure that it actually like, burned through the match or whatever, but it wouldn't do anything that um, would actually affect the flight. So, yeah. Do you have a name for your flight computer? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to you. <laughs> got to develop, we got to develop it first. <laughs> yeah. Gordon, one point and one question. Uh, a change in the <clears throat> competition rules this year for Spaceport is that uh, custom designed flight computers will not be allowed. Okay. We're running behind to get the rules updated. The other one is if your CAN bus experiences a catastrophic failure, how is that going to affect your recovery electronics? So um, it'll be pretty similar. So, so what we've done in the past is I'll have the Bluetooth modules and they communicate. And there's like a separate board uh, that has a couple microcontrollers. 
um, and they are um, basically designed to only look for like arm or disarm commands. Um, so when they receive an arm, arm command, it will maintain that arm command um, until you know, until it basically gets like a positive off. Um, so basically, even if the canvas were to fail or whatever, if they were already armed, it shouldn't cause an issue because those microcontrollers wouldn't receive any communication telling it to turn off. And additionally, even if the microcontrollers were somehow fried, all of, our circuit, all of the circuitry for the actual um, flight computers are default on. Um, so basically, as soon as uh, you plug in a battery to an arming circuit, like for a very like split second, like microseconds, uh, the computer is turned on, um, and then the microcontroller takes over and turns it off. But if the microcontroller were to fail, the circuitry is designed so that the transistor will automatically turn on. So when uh, when your team goes through project review with the reviewers, you will I guarantee you'll get quizzed on that. We've gotten quizzed on that every <laughs> the last two years. So yeah, no, they yeah they always ask about that one. So but yeah, we've had pretty good. We've had I mean we haven't had any issues with it in the last couple of years. We pulled it. I mean plus ten uh, like the uh, sp um, NASA team flew it last year a couple times and we flew it and we haven't had any issues with it since then. But yeah, we're definitely taking those kinds of considerations. Yeah, what? So it's nice to save money here and there, but are you are you at all worried about reusing uh, parts or reusing flight computers from previous years? I mean, we'll, we'll definitely test them, um, but again, these, these uh, computers are designed to be used many, many, many times. Um, so not a huge concern with that in the first place, but um, we will obviously we'll test them to make sure everything is working properly before we run them again. So. Yeah. Um, just from an organizational perspective, have you thought about synergizing uh, the CAN development with the Liquid Project and their data acquisition and electronics groups? I haven't heard about that, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a couple of quick ones. You answer if you are already. Um, my primary concerns in the way the bay is set up, that it's integrated, like regular computer cards with plug-in power and everything like that. Any failure analysis and all being done on that, just there's a lot of force on that stuff. Like you said, you know, batteries, you start having weight on there. What's going to happen if a card slips you know, an eighth of an inch? Does that shut everything yeah. down? Or? Yeah, so yeah, we haven't done anything like that yet. Um, that would be a good thing to take into account, though. And just, like I said, I haven't really got... I, really put a whole lot of thought into exactly how the day is going to be designed. Um, I like specifically how it's going to be for this year. Um, we're just kind of going off that period for now. But yeah, I just think that always concerns me when you just got some pressure fit in there. Uh, it's easy for stuff to slip. Yeah, I will say like the, if you like look, I mean, yeah, so it's like on this side it has like microcontroller pins. Um, and then on this side, these have slots. So this is like a uh, clear plastic. I can't remember exactly. It's acrylic. acrylic. Yeah. And so like these have slots, and so these cards have like notches that fit into the slots um, that support the structure the, there. Do they have slots on the PCB side too? For the vertical ones, yes. For the ver like you can see on on the very well on the back, you can see there's clear acrylic for the vertical ones that hold. Um, yeah. That, that provide a structural support there as well. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Like here. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's like, a little like yeah, but yeah, we'll definitely be thinking about that. So. The only other one was this. See, you're planning on using the telemetric for deployment duties. Yeah. Uh, you're wasting 90% of its capabilities by putting it up inside of the carbon fiber tube. I know, yeah. It. Yeah, we've, uh, yeah, I've thought about that before. I know it's like redundant because I know the telegps is literally just like the telemetry part of the, <laughs> the telemetrum. Um, but like I said, it's just it's just an issue with having having the carbon fiber body tube and restricting that and then like, unless we were to move more of that to, but then we'd have to run wires up and everything, so that's just something I would really approach. But yeah, I, I know there it does have those capabilities, but. Uh, and I'm not sure, does the color GPS, does it interact with the software to give you, I can't remember, I've never thought of one more flip yeah. Yeah. Uh, Does it give you download the data to tell you, hey, you're rich damaging, yeah. Oh. It won't give you live data, but you can, it downloads all, you can download the flight data. Well, it, my concern is, is getting something down there, uh, even if it meant putting the telemetrum down there. Instead, even though we're not going to use it for deployment duties, but to get the live downlink so we can see that, hey, the drone's out. 
Yeah, yeah, that is one There's of the You can yeah. pick up the data from it, even though in the software when you're using that, when it's in the complete telemetry link, it tells you that, you know, it tells you that it's reached yeah. apogee and everything. Yeah, but it's, it, it's, it it's can't reached apogee. It's actually like it, the charge right. fire. It's yeah. slowing down, and you can actually see it in real time. Yeah, uh, that's just. Yeah, I think it can do pretty much everything the telemetry can do, except for like the charge confirmation and like it actually fire the charges. And stuff it, and I didn't know if it did it. You might want to. It's been so long since I've flown one. We used it last year, and like yeah, we had. And last year, uh, it didn't link. I thought I think it's I think that wasn't the one that did end up bringing it. I thought the egg finder didn't like it. Yeah, the egg timer. No, it was trouble. I think it was the other one. The egg timer had trouble. Yeah. Um, there, now, had, there have been some issues with uh, Office Metro Electronics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've addressed some of those. Right. But uh, that was something that when that happened last year, I'm like, you know, dang it, why didn't we haul the rocket 300 feet away or a thousand feet away and actually see if we yeah. Pick it up. But, yeah. Uh, that would be some double check on the tele GPS. Yeah. To see that it's going to be. It, the big one is that I don't care if it tells you if the charge, but you'll be able to see it on the data of whether or not it's slowing down. You don't know it's separated. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely gives you a lot to the back. I don't know if it. I can remember if it uh, actually plots it or anything. Right. Well, that'll hang off to Rafe with recovery. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rafe Sanders, and I'm the recovery sub team lead. And the purpose of the recovery sub system is to create a system capable of recovering the BSLI Spaceport America Cup rocket to be usable for future uses. Um, we also like to educate our students on the recovery system and how you use critical thinking to solve problems. Our objectives for this year are to streamline the parachute build process and down to less situations like this. To improve the integration of our ejection charges, to make it easier when we're out in the field and getting ready to launch. And we'd like to research alternatives to black powder ejection charges. A quick system overview. So when the rocket reaches apogee, the ejection charges fire and release the nose cone, which deploys this tank drogue parachute. And then at approximately 1,500 feet, the cable cutters fire, releasing the pilot from the parachute bag. And this pulls the main parachute out of the bag. And on final approach, if everything goes well, the main is fully deployed, and the rocket lands in one piece. The design process for our main parachute, the main parachute cores are created by a MATLAB program. And this MATLAB program takes into account environmental conditions such as the altitude of the launch site and the average temperature at different altitudes above the launch site. It also takes into effect um, characteristics of the rocket, such as the expected apogee and our drag weight after apogee. And these gore sections are then stenciled onto a fabric, which is cut out by a hot knife, taped together and sewn into a French bell seam as shown here, so that the fabric interlocks well. And the drogue and pilot parachute are built by this exact same method of construction. Our ejection charges, um, as an example of the ones that the NASA rocket used last year, they are 3D printed nylon, and they consist of two canisters. A bottom canister, which is permanently attached to the bulkhead, and the flight computer. And then this top canister, which holds the actual black powder charge. And we separated them into two canisters for safer integration so that the live charges are not connected to any electronical source until we're ready to finish integration. This year, we'd like to experiment with CO2 and other chemical alternatives to black powder. And if this is not a possibility, we'd like to reduce the system to one canister to ease integration. Uh, the two biggest risks to the recovery system are a main chute deployment failure and an ejection charge failure. One cause for a main chute failure would be a tear in the parachute or tangles in the parachute lines. Um, this would result in a loss of drag that the rocket experiences on its descent. 
And the severity of this varies depending on how deployed the parachute actually gets. I know last year, for example, the 10K rocket on our first test launch, the main parachute had a very partial deployment, and it wasn't very clean of every. Um, to mitigate this risk, we exercise caution during the building of the parachute. Any sort of sharp or hot objects that come near the main parachute are very carefully handled. And to mitigate tangles in the lines, we S-fold the parachute lines so that they sort of unfold like an accordion during the um, deployment process. Another cause of main chute deployment failure would be cable cutter failure. And this would result in the main chute not deploying and simply the drogue deployment. And I can go back a couple slides. A cable cutter failure, excuse me, cable cutter failure would result in a situation like this where only the drogue is deployed and this main parachute is stuck inside the black bag. Um, we mitigate this process by having a redundant system where we have two cable cutters attached to a string of zip ties holding the bag closed. So if one does not cut the zip tie, the second cable cutter will. The first cause of ejection charge failure would be power loss to any electronic systems in the nose cone. This would cause the nose cone to stay attached to the rocket and no parachutes would be deployed, essentially turning the rocket into a missile. Uh, to mitigate this process, we test connectivity before launch to any electrical components in the nose cone of the rocket. And the second cause of ejection charge failure would be simply a lack of force from the ejection charges. Uh, we mitigate this by having a redundant system where we have two ejection charges and the second one contains more black powder than the first. So if the first charge does not probably detach the nose cone, hopefully a bigger boom will. My plan for the year, in the next few weeks, we're going to finish the drogue and the pilot parachute, and one of these will be used on the high altitude balloon launch that Gordon mentioned. And I'd like to begin the instruction and safety on how to properly manufacture and test ejection charges. After winter break, we're going to begin constructing the main parachute, and then any leftover time we have will be spent either researching and hopefully testing black powder alternatives. Any questions? Yes. On the uh, CO2, is that basically using the CO2 cartridges, like a Raptor system? Yeah, so last year we were able to research this a little bit. Um, we would basically take CO2 canisters and find ways of mechanically puncturing them. We weren't able to devise a system that properly tested the amount of force needed to puncture a canister. So that's something we're still exploring. That yeah, would still be redundant, though. Yes, and that is another issue we thought we would have, is we would have to have two canisters, each with their own means of puncturing the canister. And if the canisters have to be too big of a size, we won't have the space to fit two of them. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with it. Because uh, I reviewed a number of the teams from last year that were going that route, and that ended up being a real problem, a real, real problem. They underestimated the amount of volume Yeah, I believe last year we were testing with 25 gram cartridges, and we were very unsure if that was the proper volume. And, uh, we had teams that were both using, um, we had some that were using mechanical means, uh, basically servos to puncture the tips of the canisters, and then we had teams still doing the usual method where it's still an explosive charge, driving a pin, and so you still get back to having to use an explosive charge. <laughs> yeah, that was our main method of testing last year, was having a, slip or a small explosive pin shoot into the canister. We also tried experimenting with a solenoid valve, but you know, we were in the early stages of CO2 testing. So we'd like to continue <coughs> that and look for other alternatives this year. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, so if you go back to the deployment procedure, I was wondering if you've given much thought into how the pilot chute might interfere with the drogue chute. Because they're not necessarily going to be diagonal like that. They're probably going to be more in line with each other. So I was just wondering if you gave any thought to that. Can you repeat the question? Um, so if in, in the second diagram, the pilot chute is coming out um, below the drogue, mm -hmm. um, in real life, I'd assume it would be a lot more vertical than that. Um, have you given any thought to the pilot chute interfering with the drogue? Um, so from the videos of the test launches that we had from last year, 
the parachute bag was actually more in like a horizontal position when these cable cutters fired. Um, the length of this wire is much longer than the length of any of those cords. So the pilot deploying would be kind of pulled to the side away from the drogue and then the main would deploy and pull it up. So we haven't really experienced any sort of interference between the drogue and the pilot before. Any other questions? Uh, a simple statement. How many times have I said it? I hate, hate, hate those injection canisters. Um, <clears throat> back to this I'm trying to get quicker with the link. We need to come up with a better system that um, I we still haven't had a real successful deployment up at thirty thousand feet. Standpoint, we did was it two years ago or three years ago now, but uh, I'm okay with the black powder and everything else. But we've got to do something, and there's I passed the research along many times on how it should be designed. Yeah. So I will smack your hand with the ruler if I see anything like that getting printed, printed this year. We really, really need to. <laughs> I've told this to a few people. Um, yeah, we just got to come up with something better. We can still be safe with it, but we got to come up with something better. That's my primary goal for this year, is to fix this black powder system. <laughs> and if Good. we have the time and the capabilities to research other alternatives to black powder itself. Any last questions? All right, I will hand it off to Casey. Let's see what you made. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Casey Arkman. I am the propulsion sub team lead. Uh, how are y'all doing tonight? Good. Perfect. We're gonna talk about rocket motors. I love rocket motors. Okay, so the project purpose. Uh, the purpose of propulsion. So our purpose is to research, design, develop, and test the solid rocket motor. That's kind of in the name, right? Um, but in addition to that, we're also trying to give students and our members hands-on experience with propulsion um, and propulsion static test systems. So the picture on the left, ah, there, and the picture in the middle here, these are both static tests we've done in the past with solid rocket motors. Uh, so this year we'll continue that as a new mentioned earlier. Just a quick overview of structural components so you know everything I'm talking about uh, as we go through them. So first up here you have the motor casing. Uh, this is a 54 inch long, 98 millimeter uh, outside diameter motor casing. This is what contains the propellant um, and everything necessary to make the motor function. So some of the things that do go in that are, is the forward closure. So the forward closure is, it doesn't really matter right now, but if this is the top end, the forward closure is gonna go up there. This forward closure is a little different than what we fly with. We, when we fly, we don't have this copper tube. This is a pressure tap. Uh, we fly with a threaded forward end that we use for motor retention to hold the motor into the rocket. Down here, you have O-rings and retaining rings. So the retaining ring right here, there's two grooves that these snap into within the motor. That's what's going to hold the uh, motor pancake together. Uh, the rear snap ring actually got blown out last year, which is something we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, just to note. And the O-rings are what seal everything together. You know what O-rings are, right? Go on, most engineers. Okay, a couple other components. Uh, this is a nozzle, so we are using graphite nozzles. Um, they're commonly used in rocketry, they work very well. So that's what we're sticking with. Uh, the inside throat diameter right here and this outside diameter here, that expansion ratio is what determines a lot of the characteristics of how the motor's gonna perform. Average thrust, maximum thrust, and total impulse. So that's what we're really looking at um, as one of our components. Luckily, there's some software called BurnSim that lets us really, really well simulate that and optimize that. Uh, last up, we most importantly, I would probably say, uh, is the solid chunk grains. So these are the fuel. Uh, here's an example of a grain here. Uh, those are ammonia perchloric deposit propellant. Uh, that's the name. They have uh, 10 to 15 different ingredients in there, um, which we're not going to touch on too much today. Uh, just a general idea that that's what gives the motor, that's what burns to give the motor the thrust. That's the good controlled explosion to use. The so some objectives of propulsion. So the biggest objective this year is to rework the motor composition to ensure a successful flight. 
Uh, those of you that are aware of last year, uh, last year we had a rapid unscheduled disassembly of the motor, um, and that didn't go too well. That's this picture right here. So it doesn't really look like it, but this little dot right there, that's, that's fuel coming out the back of the motor. Um, we don't want to do that this year. So, go back. So, one of the things that we're hypothesizing happened is last year we had a big change in motor composition in relation to magnesium and aluminum. Magnesium and aluminum are two metals you can use as fuel in uh, APCP motors. So last year we had a high aluminum content and no magnesium. Uh, prior to that, in the previous year, we had zero aluminum and 78% magnesium, and that motor actually worked. Now that rocket still crashed for other reasons, but the motor worked, and that's the part we care about on this update. Uh, so this year we're gonna look back to going towards the same thing. Uh, decrease the aluminum back down to that 0%, maybe a little bit of, little bit of aluminum, uh, and bring that magnesium back up. Bring, bring that safe, what we know to be a safer fuel back up, that percentage. Uh, we're also going to prioritize, so with that, we're prioritizing motor reliability over altitude goals. So it is the 30K competition. We do want to get to 30,000 feet, but we don't want the motor to blow up. So that's the goal. Uh, and any altitude we can get as close as we can get to 30,000 feet, that's, that's just a bonus right now in my eyes. So another thing we want to do is we're going to continue developing our static test related skills and experience. Those were those two pictures on the first slide. Uh, with that, we have our, we have testing procedures that we've worked out and we've used in the past. We're always improving and iterating on those. We're gonna train our members in those. So when we do static testing, it's gonna be safe and the university's gonna love it and hopefully love us. That's always the goal. And acquire data of the motors so you don't test just to burn. I mean, sometimes you can test just to burn stuff. That's fun. Uh, but science means writing things down. So we also record the data and we can use that to characterize our motors, characterize mass flow rate, all kinds of different properties about our motors to determine if we wanna make changes to get a bigger motor, more thrust, more thrust to get to 30,000 feet. That's the goal. Uh, one minor goal I've had, I have at the bottom here, uh, we want to investigate bringing solid motor development, so the casting process when you make the motor. Right now that's done off-site with our uh, industry advisor, Gary, sitting over here. Um, it can be a dangerous process, and right now the university doesn't really want us doing it here. So one potential thing we could do is if Liquid Team does bring some of their process here, we might try to tag along. Um, it's not a big goal this year, because unfortunately, uh, in recent years, other university teams have had, there's a lot of uh, high profile incidents of issues going wrong with this. Um, so right now, we're pretty, we're pretty happy where we are. Gary's been a great resource, we're gonna continue to use him. Um, but it's something we're gonna keep in the back of our minds, if we could maybe bring it here, or bring parts of the process here. It's always an improvement to, to do things yourself. So the design process, before you can even start designing solid rocket motors, we have to read some literature, uh, see what other people have done. So one of the biggest books that is used in rocket propulsion is Experimental Composite Repellents by McCreary. Uh, that has a lot of information about motor development. There's also Rocket Propulsion Elements by Sutton, uh, also an important piece of literature. Both of those are something our members are encouraged to read. Um, maybe not understand and memorize the entire thing, but encouraged to read and get a general idea of what's going on. So next up in our design process, we use a software called Burnsim. Uh, this is a picture of what Burnsim, Burnsim is going to output here. Uh, it estimates the motor performance. As you can see, the sharp drop-offs of pressure and thrust and all those other data points, that's not, a, that's not perfect, uh, it's ideal. So we can't rely on it, but it is gonna give us an estimation of the burn time of our motor, the total impulse, uh, which is the change of momentum that we can impart into the rocket, our thrust curve, just a general idea of what it's gonna look like when it burns, uh, specific, um, specific, specific impulse, all of that information. Um, with that, we can also develop a motor then, and down here is an actual test from 2018 of an N4493 motor. And this was a successful test. So that's something we're gonna to look towards going back to. This used magnesium, not, not a high load of content. I'm gonna keep stressing that point. That's, that's the big goal this year. Um, with that, the preliminary motor concept we have, this is a PDR, this is not final. Uh, preliminary design is what was tested in 2018. So we know it worked, that's what we're looking for. It's an N4493, so 4493 is the average thrust in newtons. It's got a total, total impulse of 19,000 newton seconds. That puts it at about an 85% end motor. Uh, it's a little lower than we want to be, but we want to prioritize success. So right now, it's the preliminary design review we're gonna go with and we're gonna investigate further improvements to make to it. It's got an average, or a maximum thrust of 6651 newtons. That, that's a lot, um, by the way. Uh, it's got a burn time of 4.23 seconds, that's pretty quick, and it's got a max pressure of 818 PSI. Fun little facts. Um, those are also subject to change, of course, this is preliminary. 
Um, but so far we believe this would be a good starting ground for a motor. Um, and if we do end up having issues, we can always fall back to this because we know it's working nice. Risk to project success. Uh, propulsion is inherently a little dangerous. So the biggest risk I would say as of now for us is the Cato. Uh, once again, bring back this picture. I know it might hurt for some of us to look at. Um, it definitely hurts. But a motor Cato is something you never want. You don't want your motor to explode. Uh, this is a more severe Cato. Uh, hopefully we definitely do that. At least this is just one failure point. Um, smaller risk to project success would be a chuffed ignition. A chuffed ignition is when the igniter of the rocket burns and it doesn't fully ignite the fuel and the motor actually blows itself out, kind of like a candle. Um, that is a minor technical failure scenario because typically you can reset from that. Not always, if it is a severe chuff, you might have bigger issues. Um, we can always reset from that. And if failure to ignite, that's sort of another minor issue. Usually that just involves getting a car, going back out to the launch pad and putting a new igniter on. Uh, we haven't had an issue with that, hopefully it's safe. Um, in addition to failure scenarios, there's also casting failure scenarios, so the ingredients that go into a rocket motor can explode if they're in the right proportions. Uh, and we don't want that to happen, so to mitigate that, we have extensively outlined uh, safety protocols, and we, we continue to evaluate those, and if we see improvements, we will make improvements to that. Uh, one of the, we follow those, I know Gary has his own safety procedures when he's pouring the motors. Uh, it's just something we always want to make sure we're following to ensure we don't have any issues, especially with the ingredients and casting. Um, with the motor and trying to eliminate the risk of Mikado, like we had last year, uh, we're going to be testing the motor in its full scale configuration this year. And in addition to that, we can also test a slightly smaller motor in the uh, test flight that was mentioned earlier. And we can also do even smaller scale motors um, at the Aerospace Research Center Ohio State's property. Those are our 54 millimeter motors, and they, they give us a good idea of the propellant characterization without putting a lot of risk or a lot of high 40s. And of course, we're researching and training on self-casting methods. That's something we want to continue to research and know. We've got to understand that. This is the asteroid category. We've got to know what we're doing. Uh, just because we can't do it doesn't mean we can't know about it. So the plan for the year, um, and there's a little update to this one, which is going to be fun. So August to December, so start of the year to really the end of fall term, uh, we're researching motor improvements. That's where that aluminum magnesium changes really come into play. We can also look at casing size and nozzle tweaks. Nozzle tweaks for sure. Uh, casing size, we believe we're going to stick with that four inch casing just because we know it's worked in the past. And we do like the design of our rocket, how it slopes down like that. We also want to re reestablish contact with the Aerospace Research Center, which I did this week actually, to set up time to static test. They have two um, test cells there that are concrete reinforced. And they provide really great places to test, assuming their experiments are out of our way. Um, Really good, Chris. We want, to, we want to keep our relation with that. That's a big goal as well. Um, and we're, we're also working on our test stand. So we have uh, a test stand similar to what was shown in the first slide. Um, it needs some improvements. Some of it was put together a little backwards in the past. So we've been improving that, making sure it's all structurally sound. Uh, we're looking into running FEA on that as well. And we have an enclosure that goes around it that we've been working on improving to try to help the market be SLI in any of these enclosures. Uh, December and April. So right now, um, you see down here we have this complete full-scale static test firing. We're actually going to try to move that to December. So that's the way, right? Um, that's something that's going to give us a lot of time to evaluate our motor further. If we do have an issue with that motor, hopefully we don't, we have more time to look at that. Um, with that, that kind of brings the rest of this time period forward. We're finalizing the motor design a little sooner, uh, or at least preliminary finalizing it. That's going to be happening over the coming weeks. Uh, but hopefully we don't have to change it after that. Hopefully it all works. If we want to get more impulse out of it, we can just try to do that and then do another test. <coughs> another thing we're doing is the propulsion members. Um, when you do rocketry propulsion, you're generally supposed to be level two certified. If you don't know what that means, it's okay. It's basically just a certain level of experience within the rocketry world. Um, as a university, we're a little exempt from those requirements. Um, just because we're exempt doesn't mean we're going to use that exemption always. So almost ever I believe every member of the propulsion team is completing a level one certification rocket which is the first step to getting a level two certification if they desire um, but at least having that base of knowledge having some of that insurance coverage if they do go to their own launches uh, and just having general knowledge is really a goal we want to have uh, ultimately we would also like to travel to Dayton uh, possibly for this motor pour or for our final motor pour to help Gary with with the creation of our motor. Uh, ultimately, it's our research that goes into it and his research as well, but he really helped us out with pouring that. We love to be part of the process. As always, we're gonna be safe. Follow practice safe motor handling. Make sure we're being safe with those hazardous materials. Money for chlorate, plastic propellant is 
inherently slightly dangerous. It won't explode by nature, but it will burn, and if pressurized, it will explode. So we want to be careful about how we're doing things. Um, and also this year, due to those other university INSAs, um, we're being a little more careful about how we um, disseminate information about the motor. In the past, it's been a little more out in the open. We're being careful about that. We don't want anyone to get, a, get their hands on information that could lead to them hurting themselves or others. Uh, on a more positive note of dissemination of information, we want to pass on skills. So that's why we want to get out to see the motor before. We want to, we want to do more static tests because if everyone knows what they're doing, everyone can continue on the legacy. That's a great thing we want to do as well. <coughs> Questions? Comment. Comment, go. As a propulsion lead, you are going to need to understand everything that goes into making the motor and casting the motor. Yes, sir. You will need to do hands-on to do this. This has been a change in the rules in the spaceport for this Sweet. year. I like that change. So, well, so it's um, partially by my driving those change in the rules. So you will become the expert when it's all and you hold a the triple E or NAR level two certification. Uh, NAR gonna be a triple though. <coughs> Joy triple E. It's ten dollars. Yes, it's ten dollars now, so $10 now. It's ten dollars. You're welcome by the way. Oh is that your you're doing? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. The board did make that change. Oh perfect, thank you. Yes, no, just call me, I'll, I'll come over there. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, come to the, you know you lose your hair pouring motors. <laughs> So I have kind of a follow to that. It seems like everyone I've talked to about this has their own theory about what went wrong. And so the nice thing about not being the propulsion subject lead is I'm not supposed to fix it. Um, but I was wondering if you identified any other possible failure modes besides the element of the magnesium switch. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and this is strictly theoretical. But the propellant that was burned last year does not like corrosive performance on startup. I had the same failure at Balls this year in Nevada uh, due to the core structure. Uh, someplace over the last 15 or 20 years, I've read that magnesium has a tendency to dampen pressure spikes and motor burning. I can't find that. I spoke with Scott Kormeyer at Loki Research. He says he's never heard that, but I've read it someplace. So if you look, Casey, go back and call up the graph. If you look, this is the actual where you notice a spike at the, at the motor startup. I believe that's what caused the motor to fail, fail. And one of the goals that the propellant team has to do this year is to minimize that spike so we don't see that. So that's the best. That's the best. That's the best answer I can give you. So that's my first so far. Yeah. So. What are you saying there, though? Because I, I don't have a video here to put a GIF or anything. But this motor burn uh, actually stopped about right here. So the motor didn't burn for very long. So that's, that's big evidence that that initial, that initial pressure spike really is what caused the snap ring to fail. So I guess I didn't mention that too much. Uh, the snap ring is what failed on the back end of that motor. Uh, determining why, like you said, is always theoretical. Because we don't know exactly. You can't go back and look at it before it happened. So it's all based on just the evidence we have in the thought process. The, uh, the other thing we may want to look at is replacing, uh, in your O-ring picture, that is an external retaining ring. That's not an internal retaining ring, just as well. What is it? I kind of stole that picture, not going to lie. Yeah, that's an yeah, external good retaining point. ring. But is to try to replace the, the uh, retaining ring with a spiral arch ring so that we get 100, 360 degrees coverage yes. on that. That might help. Absolutely. Try and find everything we can to fix the issues. Yeah, definitely don't want to don't want to be doing that. Don't, don't want to. Sure was that. Besides being embarrassing, it's it expensive. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? No, I'm kidding. Only static test you're going to do this year. Currently, uh, full or total? I guess both. Uh, big motor, one, maybe two. Depends on anything changes. Yeah, definitely. Funds for that. We're definitely doing one. That's that's part of the reason. I would prefer if I had my if I had my druthers, I would like to do at least three. But same. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're I better. don't know that I have yeah. that, so it's uh, we'll we'll figure that out. Yeah, definitely one though. At bare minimum one. It we will make it happen. One full scale and how many like sub scale? So sub scale, we'll probably do one day of testing at the arc, which last year included six motors. Um, 
with those, last year we investigated, um, I know at least for one of the tests we were investigating different nozzle sizes. Uh, this year we might investigate changing some characteristics of the propellant a little bit too. Um, just small tweaks here and there, just seeing what works. Even if the data doesn't go towards this year, uh, it could be very useful. Or if we just reestablish the data we gathered last year to make sure we're still sane and make sure everything lines up. Andrew, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, I think I caught that you guys are saying you guys switched to magnesium last year. Do you know why that happened? Or switched to using magnesium? Last why we switched to using aluminum? I mean, I, I think I, I thought I heard you say, oh yeah, I'll, aluminum. Or maybe you said you didn't use magnesium last year. I was just wondering if there was a change last year. Aluminum uh, fuel in the motor is more energetic, and we wanted we wanted more more impulse. It, that's as far as I'm aware. And the trade-off, the trade-off looking at ISP was not that great. And if you look at the results, it probably wasn't worth it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was just to get get more more energy out of the motor. Yeah. We'll do it back Yeah. Other questions? Um, we'll, we'll hold it off there. Okay. Um, sorry. Other sorry. questions? Can <laughs> I was going to wrap up really quick because I know these uh, review, design review um, meetings can get pretty lengthy. Um, so we will have our final question um, section now. But I do want to say, if you have to go, feel free. Um, sorry, I'm going to run away. But thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, and again, like I said before,